Even prison walls can't stop them from smuggling in weapons and drugs. We cocaine peel in Nairobi. Now, gang members reveal how they skirt the system. These about myself. And the gang unit fights to take back control. Hands behind your head. Lay back. Oh, 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 oh. We receive threats on a regular basis. Memphis, an epicenter of American music and culture, but less than 15 miles from the nightlife of Beale Street, a band of prisoners serves hard time in Shelby County Division of Correction. Built in 1928, this prison houses inmates for no longer than 12 years. At Shelby County, a team of just seven men spearheads the battle to keep gangs under control and contraband out. They're known as the Gang Intelligence Unit, or GIU. Back in 2004, Lieutenant Tony Moore was the only man assigned to tackle the gang problem. Make sure that you lay down and do not move or do not But talk. Moore knew he needed help to fight the growing gang issue and crush their covert operations. The six officers he handpicked to work with him now make up the gang intelligence unit. We all come from different backgrounds. We all got different amount of years at this institution, but when it comes down to this unit being a gang intelligence unit, we're one, we're a team. I know we got the side though. Yeah, I had a whole new side yeah. Those gang officers, I know they got my back. And I got their back on a daily basis. This prison is home to over 30 different gangs. And contraband is a constant danger. So GIU gears up every day for an ongoing hunt. It's a lot of ground to cover. Spanning 38 acres, there are 13 buildings, including minimum, medium, and maximum security dorms. Max 8, J Building. These guys have the highest security level at Shelby. In October 2008, rival gang tensions here erupted into a violent battle. Crip and Vice Lord gangbangers were arguing over commissary items when things spiraled out of control. Crip gang member Chris Askew, a.k.a. Baby Wink, watched the violence unfold. They were like, they want to get them up. Get them up, this fight, you know what I'm saying? So they got them up. And then one thing led to another, you know what I'm saying? And then one of my homeboys hit him in the head. And then, bam! This surveillance footage captures the brawl moving quickly outside the small cell on the top tier. Inmates jump over the railing and onto the first level. They pull out weapons. And in an instant, it's mayhem. Jarek Brown, from the rival Vice Lord gang, was in the dorm, but tried to stay out of the fight. I went in my right mind because I was shocked. I ain't never seen nothing like that go on. Within minutes, nearly the entire block is involved in the riot. It's Crips versus Vice Lords, and the Crips are outnumbered. It was scary, man. My heart beating. I'm trying to dodge. People from hitting me in the head with shank that long. You know what I'm saying? Officers arrive and break up the riot. We couldn't tell who had been stabbed and where they had been stabbed, but there was blood on In all, Five inmates were seriously injured. In their attempt to prevent gang fights and stop illegal activity, officers' best weapon is the element of surprise. Have a seat on your bunk. Have a seat on your bunk. Hang it up. Hands behind your head. Hands behind your head. Lay back. Lay back. All right, let's start right here. At the top Today, of the Lieutenant Moore leads his team to 12 Block, one of the most gang-infested dorms. No one else at all, unless you're being spoken to. 
No one has to move unless you are being told to move. Now, if you got a problem following those directives, I will give you something to make you change your mind. This is what's going to happen. Gang officers are going to go from bump to bump. They're going to get you up. You're going to go to the shower area. You're going to be strip searched. Once you get strip searched, they're going to take you out to the hallway where you will sit down on the floor until we get this door completely searched. The gang unit shakes down the dorm, looking for any contraband. This includes gang paraphernalia, cigarettes, marijuana, and handmade prison knives, known as shanks. If we see somebody moving us down here in this area, like this guy just got through moving down there with the bag, he doing something. So that means he probably got something to go get his ass now. Excuse my profanity, but Come here, boss, man. Is you moving with your bag down here? I told you not to move. Inmates must line up for a strip search. I don't like stripping for no grown man. Total disrespect, you know what I'm Like trying to take my manhood or some con looking at my body. <gasps> that what it is, you know? They the police. Pigs. Yeah. I don't like poor. Take everything off. Body cavities are a common hiding place. We do a personalized assert, make them squat and cough so if they got anything up their retina, it'll fall out. All right, put them on. Back in the bunk area, officers search through inmates' personal belongings. GIU officer Richard Farrow makes a potentially deadly find in an inmate's locker box. It has a dial missing off of it. And when you have something like this, a real common thing that they do is you'll put them in the sock and hit you with it. Swinging the right way and hitting the person in the right spot and kill you did instantly. A few feet away, Officer Danny McLean makes another significant discovery. Small but dangerous shanks hidden in a favorite spot. What we got? Uh, he got a shank. He possessed another shank. The shanks were found in Gary Crawford's shoe. McLean begins to escort the inmate out of the dorm. But as Crawford packs his personal lockbox, Another hidden shank falls to the ground. Had a nine, Ben. What is Chris trying to do with Come on, bro. With not one, but two shanks found, GIU has plenty of evidence to bust Crawford. But they're not finished. They move to the beds on the other side of the block, leaving no stone unturned. You can go pat him down right now, Watts. Just make sure he ain't got no weapon on him. Right. Officers have uncovered something suspicious. Could be some marijuana. Or it could be loose tobacco. There's just as much fake marijuana going through the, through the jail as, as real marijuana. You know, they constantly have little games to try to cheat each other out of money, too, by giving them fake marijuana. The support team steps in. You always test it. I always test regardless. It might turn up, positive sound might turn around and be mixed with something else. This test will determine if it's tobacco or marijuana. You break one tube and agitate it for about a minute. If it turns purple, that's a positive test. If the leaves contain tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, the main chemical in marijuana, then the acid solution will react and change color. Already turning purple, positive for TAC. The marijuana was found in this inmate's boot. 39-year-old Donnie Sisson is no stranger to these sorts of charges. He's been in and out of prison since he was 14 years old and is serving time for aggravated burglary. But he denies the pot is his. Somebody put some dope in my shoe, man. I mean, I smoked dope, but if it was mine, I'd say it was mine. You know, I've had dope on me. I'll tell you, I had dope on me, man. I had no dope on me at all. I do smoke dope, and I do smoke dope in jail. I will not deny that. But if I was going to have any dope on me, it wouldn't be no one or two joints. It'd be an ounce of dope at a time. That's the way I do. You can ask anybody who knows me the way I jail, man. I ain't small time. I'm big time. He will be charged with possession and go to the disciplinary board to hear his case. If Sisson is found guilty, his punishment will likely be time in the hole, where offenders are locked down in a two-man cell.
for 23 hours a day. And the hole is not where these guys want to be. Next, on Behind Bars, a maximum security inmate fights the system. I'm gonna kill some though. And later, hostile inmates cope with being locked up in the hole. Less than 30 minutes from downtown Memphis stands the Shelby County Division of Correction. Here, the Gang Intelligence Unit, or GIU, leads the charge against violence in a prison plagued with gangs. Lieutenant Tony Moore heads up the seven-man team. We know what our job function is. We're here to do our job as a unit. And when we go out to do things together, we do it as one. Five days a week, they monitor the intake area. This is the first stop for new arrivals. You guys, listen up. I'm also Bradley with the gang unit. I'm not going to tell you guys how you're supposed to do this jail. You guys been here, some of you guys been in and out, so you know how this works. It could take most of the day to process them. Everyone gets an ID card, medical tests, eye exams, and an electronic scan of fingerprints. The only problems I have, pretty much you got anybody with amputees, uh, fingerprints that have been messed up because they use drugs, whatever, smoking crack, burns their fingertips. Then, the gang intelligence unit gets their turn. Everyone who comes in must reveal if they are gang affiliated. My question to you is, have you ever been affiliated? Never have been? Never in your life? Mary Anderson, right? I got you down as Crip. Inside of a gang affiliation book, we got him down as being tagged as a Crip. This book contains all of the information about gang members that has already been tagged. Is that you? Uh, I denounced it a long time ago. You denounced it a long time? That's what I asked you, had you ever been a Crip? You got any tags that represent anything on you? Let me see them. If a new inmate doesn't own up to being in a gang, his tattoos often give him away. According to Watts, this information is for their own safety. Understand, this is not something that's going to cause your time to be prolonged or anything like that. GIU estimates that about 90% of all inmates here at Shelby are gang affiliated. The prison has taken steps to keep gang members from attacking one another. After the 2008 gang fight between the Crips and Vice Lords, the prison took a hard look at their policies for the maximum security dorms. The most glaring example, the new cages added to what used to be an open recreation area. Inmates shouldn't have had shanks, but they also shouldn't have been out of their cells. These guys, all the doors are supposed to remain locked, but you see some of them did something to the doors and open the doors up. Inmates will jam the door lock and get out of their cells to roam the tiers freely. They had a lot of paper inside the doors. It alters the mechanism so it won't lock. So it's stuck between that. This lock's supposed to be out this far. The paper stuck in pushes it back. Now the door is locked. Keeping doors locked is one thing. Keeping tabs on the inmates themselves is a bigger challenge. Y'all need to do something about this man. You never know what somebody might be going through or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And it just takes that one. You know what I'm saying? Because it's jail. GIU officer Danny McLean makes daily rounds of his assigned dorm. What's up, man? You all right? I'm checking guys to see if they got any injuries. Uh, you have a lot of guys that'll be assaulted and they're laying in bed to keep the officers from seeing According to Officer McLean, being in a gang here doesn't guarantee safety. Gangs will often beat up their own members as a punishment. They call the violent acts sanctions. Inmates in this cell are just blowing off some steam, down and dirty in Max 8. But this is what those gang sanctions could look like. 
If you don't follow up on those orders, you put in violations, you have some kind of sanction placed against you, where they may be six minutes, uh, no cover up, which means they beat and punch you for six minutes, you can't cover your face, you just have to sit there and take it. And violations all the way up to death. McLean pays close attention to the troublemakers, like Gervais Hubbard, AKA Crazy Folk, who's on his way back to the hole. I've been out here for two and a half years. You know, sometimes I have problems, and you know, I go through shit, I'm on an aggravated robbery chart. A gangster disciple, or GD, 21-year-old Hubbard fights on a regular basis. That's what put him in maximum security in the first place. A lot of times you had to take a couple of officers in the building to go in and get him because he's kicking on the doors, threatening staff. He's a piece of work. What's up? Hubbard takes antidepressants to control his destructive behavior, which includes self-mutilation. He's more of a cutter. There's a lot of cutting to his arms. I stab myself and I cut myself about a hundred times. I cut my throat once, I cut my stomach. And you know, as my arm, thinking why is my arm trying to bust vessels, you know, things like that. It's crazy, you know, it's my way out. But sometimes he doesn't take his meds. See, my meds, they take energy away from me. Therefore, when it comes time for me to defend myself, I'm not gonna win. He says he's coming out the hole tomorrow. Within a week, he'll be right back. We don't give a Next, on Behind Bars, Gervais Hubbard gets a new roommate. And surveillance cameras catch a lunchtime attack. He came out and started chasing at the inmate that he was trying to get in. And later, GIU blocks contraband from prison grounds. Zero tolerance. I don't like it, period. Memphis, Tennessee. The gang intelligence unit at Shelby County is doing whatever it can to try and keep gang tension from boiling over. According to GIU officer Tony Guyton, even mealtime can be dangerous. I call it the most vulnerable part of the institution. You have, at any given time, from 200 to 300 inmates in the dining room. So that's one of those real critical moments because things jump off. Here, inmates from different buildings and dorms interact, gang members cross paths, and rivalries can explode. Sometimes you gotta be able to read it. If it's too quiet in here, it'll go down. Inmates eat facing forward, making it easier for officers to keep watch. With more than 125 surveillance cameras throughout the prison, Inmates know they're being monitored, even in the cafeteria. Cameras caught a recent fight between cafeteria worker Charles Hunt III and a fellow inmate. After landing a swift punch, Hunt chased the other inmate through the tray window, out of the kitchen, and into the cafeteria. Once I got out there, they, they, they pointed at me like, get him, get him. So I'm looking around, still didn't see dude. So that's when I just gave him to put, let him put me in handcuffs. Today, surveillance cameras in the cafeteria catch this prison brawl, which quickly attracts onlookers. Officers receive a code blue over the radio, the signal for an inmate on inmate fight. On site officers break it up before GIU make their way through the crowd. We had a code blue, an inmate, one of the kitchen workers on the serving line. You leave the serving line, come over here, hit the guy, assault him in the jaw. The other guy did hit back. Inmate Darian Davis claims he was ambushed for no reason. And he had ran over there and sprung on me. Or he come over there and hit me. I jumped up defending myself whole. Davis is sent to the hole, pending a disciplinary hearing. Surveillance cameras can only do so much. Hey, how you doing, sir? Officer Guyton has his own method to try and prevent gang violence. Brethren, brethren, brethren. 
He grew up in the same neighborhood as a lot of the inmates. So Guyton is able to insert himself into the complex gang world within the prison. The officer knows mutual respect is key to gaining trust and valuable information. Every time I shake hands with an inmate, that's an inmate that has the rank on my compound. I mean, the first two guys that I did shake hands with, they had high rank and vice over. So I have to keep that, that bonding with them so we can keep, keep in communication at all times. And gang leaders have enough power to talk with Guyton and not be labeled as snitches by other gangbangers. Slick conversation. He just told me that he'd been given the responsibility of the building he just moved out of. He's a vice lord. So he won't let me know that he's the coordinator over there. Now Guyton knows who to go to when there's a problem between rivals. This benefits the inmates by keeping them in the good graces of the gang intelligence unit and helps GIU stop gang beefs from escalating. So I mean, they, they accompany me without me having to go fish for them. See how quick that was? Sometimes, rival gangbangers can live together in peace without the help of GIU. Lately, Gervais Hubbard, a gangster disciple, has been getting to know his new cellmate, Vice Lord Julian Avery. Avery is doing nine years for aggravated burglary, sexual battery, and setting fire to personal property. I'm an international jewel thief. You know what I'm saying? I steal. That's what I do. Man, this so crazy. Being in the jail, man, it turn to an animal, man. You know what I'm saying? Man, it turn to an animal, man. Make it want to go crazy, man. And I'm caging them like a lion, like a tiger. Vice lords and gangster disciples are sworn enemies. But these two have found a way to live together, if for no other reason than a shared goal, survival. My, my means my family, yeah. We do whatever we gotta do to get out this cell, because this cell would, would drive you crazy. To get out, they act out. It's called popping the whip. We've been here cooped up so long in this cell, we want to get outside and get some fresh air. So we call it popping our whip, doing something, either it's getting sprayed, get beat up by staff, faking an uh, injury. We'll do what we got to do to get a breather. And they'll do what they can to communicate with fellow inmates. Avery can use even a benign item, like soap, to send a signal in the form of war paint or a coated mask. A certain mask that I have on with this paste, you know what I'm saying, it lets my other people know that's with me what code I'm seeing it. He says one kind of mask means he has a beef with a rival gang. If I got the mask on, his hand full over my face, you know what I'm saying, they know it's time for war. But if I got the mask on, he just on my forehead and I got my nose covered up, that means that I'm in need, that means I need help. He also has a code for trickery against the staff. If I got the mask on and it go like this, I got two squirrels that look like little baby snakes, they know that I'm trying to outsmart the staff. When it's filled in completely, Avery would be sending a different message to his cohorts. Inmate on inmate fight. Next, Hubbard and Avery fly off the handle in Max 8. And later, GIU discovers contraband hidden deep within prison walls. A little baby here. It helps us to look deeper. Every day, it's something new for the gang intelligence unit of the Shelby County Division of Correction in Memphis. But no matter what, it's the same two enemies that they face, day in and day out. Gangs and contraband. J Building, Max 8, has plenty of both. This is where the ultimate villains of Shelby County serve time. Men like gangster disciple Gervais Hubbard and his cellmate, Vice Lord Julian Avery. These inmates play by their own set of rules, and the gang unit can't be everywhere at once. Avery uses soap to create a war mask. The soap is allowed in prison, but hoarding medicine is not. 
But what we gotta do, we gotta have our own tricks, trades, and hustles, you know what I'm saying? Like me, one of my hustles, what's that? This is my hustle right here. Avery uses pills of any sort, antidepressants to sleeping pills for his advantage, especially against his enemies. This right here, this will knock you out. This right here, I put this in guys' food, you know what I'm saying? Because it's a powder form. So I put this in the guy's food when I'm trying to take something from him or sneak into a sneak attack. I put this in their food right here. This is knocking out like guaranteed 10 seconds. And he'll use these drugs on himself to go into attack mode. This right here, these I pop for myself. These give me hype. It's crazy. I love it. Oh, yeah, that's While Avery and Hubbard pop pills in the hole, inmates like Randy Campbell, a.k.a. Rambo, make themselves at home in the general population. Wherever you go, downtown, the famous Rambo. I'm known for um, smoking crack and having a lot of money to do it with. I get about hustling, man. I can sell you a dream. On the outside, Rambo sells more than dreams. He's a pimp. Sex sale in my neighborhood. Do sex sale in your neighborhood. In prison, he thrives using his street smarts and charisma. Here, Rambo and his cohorts have their own way of doing things when the officers aren't around. Let me take you around and show you some of the shit that go on in here. Can I? Come on. His first stop, the dryer. This is the dryer where you can dry your clothes and shit. You can wash your clothes. Then to this wall where inmates illegally light up cigarettes or marijuana. See this old burnt up ass wall right here? This wick wall is scarred brown from the butts of joints and cigarettes. Here, inmates light a piece of rolled up toilet paper to use as a wick. They'll get a spark by using two batteries, the ends of wires, or anything that can get the paper lit. What's the bag on? Ain't no more smoking. Another taboo wall is around the corner. Here, inmates scrawl pornographic graffiti. You know guys come here and play with themselves looking at these pictures? You know, guys actually come in and yank them one out of there, you know? Prisoners will do whatever they can to get by in this underground society. <laughs> Many find some unofficial job or task to fulfill their needs, called hustling. This guy's hustle? Those items can be anything. Soap, books, food off the commissary, or something illicit. Yeah, cigarettes and weed will do. Join weed, I like uh, t-shirt box and socks, yes. Preventing the exchange of this contraband is an uphill battle for the gang intelligence unit. Contraband can range from uh, drugs to, to a weapon. Once a forbidden item is inside, it becomes jail currency. Traded, bought, and sold. David Coleman knows this. He's a level seven maximum security inmate, but has more freedom than most. Coleman is one of a handful of inmates allowed to move freely within his lockdown dorm. He brings food to the inmates and cleans up the common area known as the Rock. As a result, inmates like Coleman are nicknamed Rock Men. I make sure the hall cleaned up, do the bathroom back there, uh, make sure each dog get fed and stuff like that. Rock Men are given this job based on good behavior but Coleman sometimes takes advantage of his freedom for more corrupt purposes. Passing contraband items, notes, and messages between gang members. Tools, 
That's the biggest thing in your way. Cocaine, anything you want in your pills, all in. Anything. This is jail. Being so close to the meals, some rock men may target their enemies by poisoning the food. Inmate Courtney Scroggins is in on aggravated robbery, assault, and indecent exposure. He claims a rock man put glass shards in his meal. All of a sudden, some sharp pain just came to my throat, and I just started coughing up blood. But officers can't always trust appearances. The blood could have come from a self-inflicted cut in his mouth, not a rock man. Scroggins has a reputation for crying wolf and faking injuries. For now, the staff will take Scroggins to the infirmary, but won't investigate his claims. If a rock man like Coleman is ever caught poisoning an inmate's food or transporting contraband, he'd lose this job and the freedom that comes with it. Coleman and most of his fellow Maxers want him to keep his responsibilities. Yeah, I'm the only guy they get. Everything got come through me, so if you don't put no trust in me, then you ain't gonna get what you won't get. It's simply there. Next, a three-on-one knife fight. I was boxed in, I didn't have nowhere to run, and I was cornered. And later, a rebirth for one inmate, prison style. It's just a tradition, really. Memphis, Tennessee. Shelby County Division of Correction. Here, the gang intelligence unit is an elite team of six officers and one lieutenant. They know the ins and outs of this prison, the inmates, and their affiliations. It's a non-stop job, with at least one of the GIU officers on duty every day of the week. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Because there's no telling when gang violence can erupt. A former gangster disciple, Ebony Marshall, is now known as a neutral because he's not affiliated with a gang. But he still claims to have a bad reputation amongst fellow inmates and the staff. What am I known for here? Being a pain in the ass with staff? Go ask anybody who the most hated inmate is on this compound. They'll tell you me. 37-year-old Marshall's been in here before, but he says things aren't the same as they used to be. The difference from 10 years ago when I was out here, eight, nine years ago, is that you got a lot of gangs out here now. And the gangs are composed of mostly young guys. It was on May 5th, 2009, that Marshall became a victim of these young gangbangers. The incident was captured by surveillance cameras. Out on rec time, Marshall stands at the door of a neighboring cell in J Building. A group of inmates approach. Marshall pulls off his shirt, ready for a fight. It was funny to me until I saw them damn knives. Armed with shanks, three gangster disciples attack Marshall. Damn, I wanted to run in, but I was boxed in. I didn't have nowhere to run, and I was cornered. The fight only lasts about 90 seconds. But it's 90 seconds too long. Marshall has been seriously injured. Per protocol, officers wait for appropriate backup before going in. I only saw two shanks. The other one was shit, man, it was like a foot long, and it was sharp. I got some slices. I got like slice cuts, which I could guess was from the long one, and I got two actual puncture wounds in the back. The gang intelligence unit is always on the hunt for shanks and other contraband throughout the prison. Today, Shelby County Administrator Anthony Alexander prepares the staff for a shakedown. We've got some contraband inside of Charlie Building. That's nothing unusual for us. We've got some areas that we're going to pinpoint this morning, which is Charlie and Delta Dorm inside of C Building. We tie them up, shake them down, find out what they got. Look, let's see inmates know that we're going to come after the contraband. You know, every facility is going to have a contraband problem, but we're just not going to ignore it. Uh, if we get this type of information, we're going to target those areas tomorrow. GIU leads the massive team into C building. Every man have a seat on your bunk. 
Hands behind your head. Put on your bunk. Hands behind your head. Lay on your bunk. Lay down. Lay down. No hiding spot is off limits. Shower heads, wall sockets, even the toilets. The feces was in here. I'm sure it was something under there. I'm not gonna put my hand in there. They will. So I flushed it. They can't get it, we can't get it. When their hands don't fit in hard to reach places, GIU have a few tricks of their own. Hey, have anybody took the snake and looked up there yet? Officers use a snake camera up above bunks or even behind the toilets where inmates might toss contraband. I can't see natural, my hand won't go all the way to it, so I'm going to use this now to make sure nothing else is in there. This tool has a small camera on the end of a flexible arm. A little compartment right behind the toilet on the wall. There's a lot of space back here, but can you see that my light can go all the way through. There's something clogging it up. Officer Guyton can see something is there, but can't tell what it is. Within minutes, they detach the toilet from the wall, remove the pipe, and retrieve the contraband. The MP3 player. This one. I'll grab one here. Shakedowns also allow GIU to intercept gang communications. Sometimes you find cold inside the letters. Gangbangers have also developed a secret way of communicating right in front of prison staffers. It's based on traditional American sign language. Here in Max, Building E, inmates discuss a recent gang fight. They got their own uh, alphabet, and if you don't know what you're looking at, if you don't you know, know how to decipher it, uh, they could be putting a hit out on you, they could be putting a hit out on another inmate, uh, tell them to bring some contraband. And if you don't know how to break the codes down, they look like mess to you. Next, on Behind Bars, GIU stops contraband as it enters the prison. Looks like you got a knife in his pocket. And Ebony Marshall bids Shelby County a not-so-fond farewell. Just tore the Bible up and spread it all over the floor. The Shelby County Division of Correction in Tennessee. Illegal contraband can enter the facility lots of ways. So the gang intelligence unit doesn't just monitor those behind the bars, they keep a close watch on people coming in. For some convicts, their sentence is not to serve time locked up, but to come here for class. They must attend courses at the day reporting center, like Anger Management or Alcoholics Anonymous. On this morning, GIU officer Richard Farrow and Lieutenant Moore catch Anthony Gray walking in for anger management class with a prohibited item. Sir, you just told me you didn't have a cell phone. What's this? This guy got Farrow. He claimed he didn't have a cell phone. He got a cell phone on. Looks like he got a knife in his pocket. Oh, get your hand. I swear to God, I didn't. I'm very sorry I didn't. GIU has zero tolerance. Their hard-lined approach has significantly clamped down on contraband entering the compound. In addition to the cell phone and pocket knife, GIU finds cash and pills, all of which are prohibited. And Gray's nervous explanations rouse even more suspicion. That's my girlfriend's pills, blood pressure pills. This is my prescription, like I said. It's Viagra. I ain't got none of the same. A canine team searches his car. They find two hunting knives in the trunk. This would be illegal on prison property. Gray will go downtown to jail and could eventually end up right back here, but behind bars. Convict Josh Pickler is searched on his way into the day reporting center. Instead of books, his backpack is full of booze. Which is a pint of uh, scotch, and you got a uh, one can of light. Alcohol is forbidden anywhere on prison grounds. 
and Pickler knows it. Look, here's not mine. Here's not mine. It's my 27 year old brother's. It's his backpack. I borrowed it from him. I didn't know it was in there. Having been sentenced to day reporting classes, Pickler already has a conviction. This offense is a felony. So now, he'll be going to jail. Zero tolerance. I just, I, I don't like it, period. I take it personally. Over in J building, inmate Ebony Marshall's wild days are over. The self-proclaimed most hated man in Shelby County is getting released. I'm supposed to be gone, man. I don't know what's over. Hopefully that'll be the end of the day, but if it's not, I read, read the Bible, take my meds. On his way out, he commits a final act of defiance against the staff, trashing his cell. He just tore the Bible up and spread it all over the floor. Now, I hadn't seen that before, but you know, they do things like that when they get discharged. I guess he's leaving a message, you know. So that's why he left his cell. We're going to clean it up in a minute. In another maximum security dorm, Marcus Bean was originally convicted for aggravated burglary. But bad behavior while inside added up to extra time. Not worth it. Today, Bean is finally getting out. His fellow inmates will say farewell in the form of a prison style baptism. It's just a tradition, man. You know what I'm saying? You do everybody. It's called wetting him up. When somebody go home, you wet him up. And the purpose of wetting him up is not just to put water on him, clean him off before he go back out to the street so he won't be trying to make his way back out here. Along with Bean, 50 other inmates are being released tonight. Honestly, it's scary. We have a discharge going home as large as that. It's a certainty that most of them will be back within a 30-day period. And the members of GIU will be waiting for them. Stop! Right there! The big goal of the gang unit is to make sure that we keep this institution safe and secure. I think we all feel like we had that brotherhood instilled in our soul. That's what makes us click together and work together. It's a tight group. From hunting contraband to squashing gang violence, the gang intelligence unit will do everything they can to keep the inmates in line at the Shelby County Division of